Margaret Chase Smith is one of the truly great heroes of American political history. Uh, first woman elected to both the houses of Congress. She started her career as a secretary for her husband, who, uh, who, who was a politician. And when he died relatively young, well, she, he was considerably older than she was, she moved in and she essentially took over his seat and she began winning elections in her own right uh, uh, from then on. And she moved fairly quickly through the ranks. Um, it was kind of an unheard of thing. There had been appointed people in, uh, in, in Congress and the Senate, certainly, before women, but it was still kind of a rarity. And so she was quite remarkable in that. And as the Republican senator from Maine in 1950, she, uh, she rose to the floor and made a relatively short speech, but one that was powerful, one that was historically significant, and one that took a lot of guts. She was only uh, like a year into her first, uh, into her tenure in the Senate. Uh, she would go on to serve for another, uh, I think, 22 years from there, but she didn't know that at the time. She was still the newbie. But uh, in uh, this one little speech on June 1st, 1950, she um, stood up against the most powerful interest in the Senate of her day. Ooh. Um, the, all the men were kind of cowering. This woman stood up and declared what she thought was right in the face of uh, a kind of bullying cabal of, uh, of a few other senators around one senator that senator being Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin. Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, of course, was the motivating uh, figure behind the so-called communist witch hunts of the late 40s and early 50s in the wake of uh, the, uh, the end of World War II, during which the Soviet Union was a uh, U.S. ally in helping to defeat the war, of course we began, or once the war was over, we started looking very askance at the communists over there, and uh, we began what became known as the Cold War. And a big facet of that was a fear throughout the nation that the, uh, the communists were going to try and overthrow uh, the American government and install communism here and that everywhere, everywhere throughout the US government, there were disloyal members of, uh, of the society who were actively seeking uh, to install Soviet rule here. Um, put all that aside. Uh, the tactics used by McCarthy and his, uh, and his allies in this cause uh, and there were quite a few of them. Uh, the tactics involved accusing uh, many people of uh, seditious acts of treason. Uh, they very famously persecuted uh, people for uh, opinions they had expressed 20 years before during the Depression. If you went to a meeting that questioned the uh, uh, that question the economic structures of the United States. Uh, if you went to a meeting or signed a petition or just knew somebody who did one of those things, then 20 years later you were somehow quite suspicious. And of course, if you think about it, uh, that casts a pretty wide net because, well, you know, if you were walking around the United States in the 30s and you weren't questioning the current economic structures of the United States, in the middle of the depression then you know you just weren't particularly awake so a lot of people saw their lives destroyed a lot of people saw their uh their life's work just thrown aside and their reputations trashed to the point where they would not only lose their jobs 
in uh, a lot of people in government, a lot of people in show business, famously, a lot of people just in ordinary walks of life. They would lose their job, but also lose their ability to get another job because their name would be so tarnished that they would become, in effect, toxic, and they couldn't get, they couldn't make a living. And some people went uh, 20 years before they could make a job or, you know, make a living, have an income. Um, this was a ongoing problem for many years, but it really started to come to the fore in the late 40s. And so when Margaret Trace Smith took to the Senate floor on June 1st, 1950, it was probably, you know, at, at its strongest point. It had been roaring for a while there, and everybody in Washington has suddenly realized that, okay, this isn't going away. This isn't just a, a one news cycle story. So it was, it had legs, it had power. And this all made McCarthy, uh, Senator McCarthy, much more powerful and much more emboldened. He was somewhat reckless in the way he just destroyed people's lives, often on no evidence at all, just through innuendo and, uh, and baseless accusations. And this created this terrific environment of fear uh, an intimidation and a unwillingness to speak up. Everybody was just keeping their heads down, particularly in the U.S. Senate, where supposedly uh, our great national leaders were uh, disposed to stand up against such tyranny. But they weren't. They were all cowering under their desks, so to speak. Uh, except, of course, Margaret Chase Smith. Now, that's the context, that's the background. Um, what she does in this speech is really quite extraordinary because she shows a great deal of discipline in how she goes about attacking McCarthy. Because it's one thing to just stand on a soapbox and attack McCarthy. But she knows that she is a very fresh uh, freshman senator who is also a woman and is, you know, perhaps uh, her colleagues might be a little predisposed to dismissing what she says as, oh, you know, oh, she's just so emotional and hysterical, as women are. But she goes about this speech with a clear eye on her target and um, doesn't just give in to her own sense of outrage which I think is quite genuine, but suffused in this, um, she goes about it with a sense of purpose, with a sense of, okay, what do I want the result to be from this speech? And so it's relatively short, but it's a masterclass in showing how you can make a point uh, concisely and... Uh, uh, successfully. Declaration of Conscience. Mr. President, I would like to speak briefly and simply about a serious national condition. It is a national feeling of, of fear and frustration that could result in national suicide and, that, and the end of everything that we Americans hold dear. That's pretty dramatic. I would almost say melodramatic. But the clear focus here, the clear impression is that it is a national problem, something that we should all care about, not something individualized, not something petty, but something of broad import. Hitting that word, national, national, national again. Raising the stakes. It is a condition that comes from the lack of effective leadership either in the legislative branch or the executive branch of our government. And here she sets up what today would be criticized as a kind of both sidesism, but this is the genius of the speech. Um, both sidesism means that oh, they're all bad. Republicans, Democrats, the Congress, and the President, all you know, ah, oh, they're all just you know, uh, they're all terrible. Uh, when in fact, in this context, what she's really attacking is very much her own side. She is a Republican senator, and she is taking on 
another Republican senator. And she knows that she cannot make a frontal attack denouncing him and have it be really particularly successful. She needs to garner the support of the other senators, none of whom much like McCarthy, uh, to stand up to him against them. And if they all hold together, they can ultimately defeat him because he'll be uh, outvoted, quite frankly. So she sets up a kind of a straw man argument where she, uh, where she is perfectly content, and some of it is quite genuine, not straw man, uh, where she is willing to throw some blame at the Democratic uh, president and the Democratic leaders of the Senate and the Congress. She's not going to just trash her side. She needs to get their support by showing that, well, yeah, okay, she can, she can bust on the, uh, the Democrats a little too. Uh, it, it garners support. Um, her contention here is, uh, is pretty pointed, though. She lays blame all around, but she's really quite specific in, in what she's zeroing in on. There. I speak as briefly as possible because too much harm has already been done with irresponsible words of bitterness and selfish political opportunism. This is almost entirely about McCarthy. And notice also, I speak as simply as possible because the issue is too great to be obscured by eloquence. So she's disdaining rhetoric. She's disdaining words. Now, this is sort of the, the flinty main um, politician that you see here saying, you know, just plain spoken. But it's also a sign that, okay, she's trying to put aside any suggestion that she is just speaking to hear herself talk. She just wants to focus on the content of what she's saying. But of course, the way she is framing it is, uh, is quite ingenious in its own way, no matter what she says about it. Uh, Mr. President, I speak as a Republican. I speak as a woman. I speak as a United States Senator. I speak as an American. She lays out this little formula where of, uh, I would say, ascending importance um, of her identities that she will come back to and click through later. And then she goes into this uh, little passage where she, um, she takes some shots at uh, what is essentially a, an inside baseball argument, where after setting this up as a national problem, she suggests that, well, really, it's really just a petty little Senate thing. Um, well, almost. She, uh, she criticizes that, um, uh, that the Senate itself has let itself uh, become somewhat corrupted. Uh, the United States Senate has long enjoyed worldwide respect for the great, as the greatest deliberative body in the world. It's a standard line, you know, the greatest deliberative body in the world. Uh, you can see that, you know, there there is perhaps a little hint of irony there. Um, there is perhaps, you know, maybe that's a brag, maybe that's a humble brag, maybe that's a little twist of the knife, like you know, great. But you guys are acting like clowns. Uh, there is that possibility there. I'm not going to say which way she falls on it. I'm just going by the words on the page. I don't have a recording to, to guess her tone. Uh, but recently that deliberative character has too often been debased to the level of a forum of hate and character assassination sheltered by the shield of congressional immunity. And then she starts laying out this, uh, uh, this critique of the Senate saying that, well, you know, uh, as senators, we have to abide by rules about speaking about other senators. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to level personal attacks against another senator on the floor of the Senate. Uh, and so that tends to stifle debate. The idea is to keep it from getting devolving into just, you know, personal attacks and to maintain a sense of decorum. Uh, but she contrasts that to other people don't have that same protection. And the people whom McCarthy keeps attacking and vilifying in public to reporters day after day after day, destroying their lives, uh, they don't have that same protection. They don't have that same uh, immunity from criticism that we senators enjoy. So 
she's pointing out to her other senators that, okay, you know, understand, uh, well, check your privilege, essentially. We're all supposed to be criticized here, or we're all supposed to be polite here, but other people do not have that same protection, and we need to understand that and be conscious of that. And she needs to lay that foundation early. It is strange that we can verbally attack anyone else without restraint and with full protection, and yet we hold ourselves above the same type of criticism here on the Senate floor. Surely the United States Senate is big enough to take self-criticism and self-appraisal. Because McCarthy is sitting behind this kind of immunity, uh, and, and nobody is going to attack him. One, uh, for one reason, the rules of the Senate, which explicitly forbid anybody criticizing, but also for the, uh, the power that he wields. If anybody criticizes him, he will just point around and say, you're a communist too, and none of those other senators want that. So he is uh, almost invulnerable, and she is pointing out that, um, well, this is complete hypocrisy. Notice also, he is never mentioned in this speech. By this point, it is very explicit in the way they're talking about these, these demagogic attacks, um, these slanders. It is very obvious uh, whom she is attacking. This is all about McCarthy, but she never mentions his name. Partly because if she mentions his name, that would be out of order. She would, somebody would rise in objection. She would be shut down immediately. She's not allowed to say his name as, you know, to single him out in a kind of criticism. But also by not saying it, it, it lands even more perniciously. It's uh, by not saying his name. Everybody knows who she's talking about, and the audience is sitting there getting uncomfortable because they know, and she's relying on them to know. And what we're all talking about, we all know what we're talking about, but I'm not going to say it explicitly, but we all know what we're talking about. And if you know what we're talking about, then you're part of the problem. It's genius. It makes people start to squirm and feel uncomfortable, like, yeah, I do know what you're talking about, and I know, yeah, it's, it's bad. I think it is high time for the United States Senate and its members to do some real soul searching and to weigh our consciences, uh, our consciences as to the manner in which we are performing our duty to the people of, the, of America and the manner in which we are using or abusing our individual powers and privileges. This is um, this is McCarthy. We are ab he is abusing his power and his privilege, and she is calling on her fellow senators to just put an end to that. Um, just lift the uh, uh, the lift the prohibition on calling him out. Um, But it also keeps it very personal to the senators at this early stage of the speech because she's speaking to them. This is about them more than no matter how her, how soaring her opening was about it being a national problem, this is right now just a problem of the Senate. So she's starting locally. And think about how she starts uh, her, uh, uh, how she lays out that list also. Um, I speak as a Republican, a woman, a United States Senator, and as an American. Again, that's a kind of hierarchy, an ascending hierarchy of identities. And so she's starting very local, just like that. She's starting with the most local version of that, which is her speaking as a Republican. And she's criticizing other Republicans here. She's starting local, and she is building from there. There is a great logical arc to this speech that um, is undeniably disciplined and organized and logical. And so you cannot dispel her as just an hysterical woman. There is a great art here. No matter how much she will say, you know, oh, eloquence, forget it. No, there is a discipline here. It's not about just flowery words, but in the structure of this speech, she shows uh, absolute discipline and focus and intelligence. 
of she lays out her criticism of McCarthyism. She uh, she says, uh, you know, those of us who shout the loudest about Americanism in making character assassinations are all too frequently those who, by our own words and acts, ignore the same basic, some of the basic principles of Americanism. Gee, that doesn't sound familiar today. Uh, but she itemizes these, the right to criticize the right to hold unpopular beliefs, the right to protest, the right to independent thought. The exercise of these rights should not cost one single American citizen his reputation or his right to a livelihood, nor should he be in danger of losing his reputation or livelihood merely because he happens to know someone who holds unpopular beliefs. And this is the entire McCarthy program. This is McCarthyism writ large. Everybody recognizes it at this point, and again, she's not calling him out by name. The American people are sick and tired of being afraid to speak their minds lest they be politically smeared as communist or fascist by their opponent. Freedom of speech is not what it used to be in America. And look at what she does there. Um, she redefines conservatism. Right then, McCarthy was defining the conservative wing of the Republican Party as being anti-communist. And nobody's going to accuse uh, uh, Margaret Chase Smith of being pro-communist. But she is defining it as, she is defining the job of the Republican Party as being conservative in that we conserve our values. And here, the value of, uh, uh, of speaking your mind, the value of free speech, um, it, it, it is being, in her view, uh, thrown away. So she's here to stand up for a conservatism that conserves freedom of speech, as opposed to the radical um, trashing of that individual right in, in, in framed in the, uh, in, in the Bill of Rights by McCarthy and his allies. She is entirely undercutting his uh, his hijacking of the Republican conser of the conservative movement within the Republican Party, and she is saying no. We are about standing up for individual rights. We are about protecting those rights, and conservatism is about saving what works. Right to free speech has worked and has been a tradition of this nation. We are going to protect it and keep it from being thrown away like McCarthy and his radicals. It's brilliant the way she is building this argument to sway her naturally conservative Republican senators and appeal to them on their, uh, on their grounds. If they are truly conservative, as uh, you know, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio and and the others of that, the other giants of that ilk, uh, uh, were then, if they are truly conservative, they will care about keeping traditions of America constant. And she points out McCarthy as the aberration to be zeroed out. Um, and then she lays out this great ending where you're having enumerated very clearly exactly what the problem is with McCarthy, that he is a radical, that he is uh, destroying people's lives, that through innuendo and accusation and unsubstantiated uh, charges, he is just decimating uh, <clears throat> whole quarters of America. On, on, on a baseless fear campaign, then she returns to where she began by itemizing her different, uh, her different identities and saying how she, uh, or uh, specifying her appeals specifically within the frames of these ascending uh, identities. As a Republican, I say to my colleagues on this side of the aisle that the Republican Party faces a challenge today not unlike the challenge that it faced back in Lincoln's day. 
Republicans love Lincoln. Republicans love to point out that they were, you know, that they were the party of Lincoln. So again, appealing to those Republican senators sitting there just you know, getting a little uncomfortable in their seats, squirming around like, oh, God, when is this woman going to stop talking? She's making that appeal and trying to play to them and saying, look, we're all on the same side. I am trying to save our party, not let it get trashed by this clown. You know, today our country is being psychologically divided by our confusion and the suspicions that are bred in the United States Senate to spread like cancerous tentacles of know-nothing, suspect-everything attitudes. Uh, Paranoids and conspiracy theorists. Uh, Where'd that come from? Who knows? Certainly, we don't have that problem today. Uh, Today, we have a Democratic administration who has developed a mania for loose spending and loose programs. Again, bringing in the both sidesism, bringing in the Democrats to beat up on for the audience of Republicans. She knows who she's talking to. She's not just going off, you know, on her own, uh, uh, her own inspiration here. She knows she is talking to Republicans. And one thing that will unite them is the opportunity to beat up on the Democrats. And hey, who's the top Democrat? Truman sitting in the White House. You know, he's got all these crazy spending plans and, you know, loose programs and loose spending. That's, that's just, you know, that's going to put the warm tinglys in, the, in any Republican uh, senator sitting there <clears throat> because now she needs to gather them all together to uh, for her big wrap up. She needs them on her side. So she's saying, look, I know I've made you uncomfortable for a few minutes talking about McCarthy, but now let's all get together and see this in a frame that we can understand and that, you know, let's she's willing to beat up on the Democrats to do it and the Democrats can take it. Um, that's what it was. So, so she criticized the Democrats to bring them over on the uh, onto her side. America is rapidly losing its position in, uh, uh, as leader of the world because the Democratic administration, Truman, has pitifully failed to provide effective leadership. Again, bringing them along. Let's beat up on Truman a little uh, because uh, the stakes are too high. We need to get rid of McCarthy. And until you get rid of McCarthy, you really can't criticize Truman too much. He's, uh, McCarthy is taking up all the oxygen. So if you want to get back to conventional Republican criticisms of a democratic administration, you need to get McCarthy off the headlines. Then she turns back yet to displace it meaning the, uh, the, uh, the, de- uh, the Democratic administration, with a Republican regime embracing a philosophy that lacks political integrity or intellectual honesty would prove equally disastrous to the nation. Here we're back to the nation. And she says, you know, as bad as the Democrats are and how bad they're sullying everything with their wild-eyed spending and all of this stuff, um, Truman was actually relatively frugal. Um, <clears throat> As bad as that is, we are just as bad. She's got to start with the one to get them to uh, to get them to the other place. To, to you start with criticizing others, and then you can extend that to criticizing yourselves. Uh, that's an uncomfortable place to be, and she knows that it's a hard sell with uh, with uh, Republican senators who don't like being challenged. Um, the nation sorely needs a Republican victory. This is about four or five months before election day for Congress. Um, but I do not want to see the Republican party ride to political, uh, victory on the four harshmen of calumny, fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear, which is, uh, it's, it's a McCarthy bumper sticker right there. Um, I doubt if the Republican Party could do so simply because I do not believe the American people will uphold any political party that puts political exploitation above national interests. Surely we Republicans are not that desperate for victory. Now here she's bringing it back to the national concern that everything we do here in the Senate has national repercussions. It reflects on the nation itself. Um, and again, that, that nice little tight uh, thing, we Republicans saying, you know, we're all on the same side here. You have to stand up with me in criticizing this clown over here. 
uh, and then she 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 makes an appeal for you know we need to get uh, get back to what we can do. Truman's going to be in the White House for at least another two years. <clears throat> uh, they're concerned uh, about their position and the ability to affect any change whatsoever. McCarthy is just making that harder because he's taking up all the oxygen in the room, and she wants the she wants to see the Republican Senate, the Republican Congress, uh, Republican members of Congress, uh, play the part of a loyal opposition. She says, you know, we're not in a position to because of our minority status, we're not in a position to necessarily make a lot of uh, make a lot of policy, but we can we have uh, the power and the integrity of our uh, of our voices. And if we take that seriously, we uh, we can make an argument on the merits for our uh, for our positions. But if we don't take that seriously, nobody's going to take it seriously. So we need to uh, underscore that to strike the kind of balance of government uh, that conservative Republicans are naturally more disposed to. They're going to uh, say, yes, okay, we, we don't want wild-eyed, we want balance, we want balance of powers, we want checks and balances, we like all of these things because that keeps things relatively steady, which is the preferred mode of conservative Republicanism in general, not, you know, radical changes. <clears throat> And she does give the little uh, thing because she is identified, you know, as a Republican. And here she's speaking all in Republican terms. And then she comes to, as a woman, I wonder how the mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters feel about the way in which the members of their families have been politically mangled in this Senate debate. And I use the word debate advisedly. Here, ooh, arguably a little sexist, you know, they're their only concern as, as women. And, you know, it's not like... They don't have the right to vote right now. She's not appealing to them on that. She's appealing to them on the basis of, well, you know, your relationship to the men in your lives. Uh, this is really more the determining identity that you should consider. So here, again, she is playing down a little bit any, uh, any sense of uh, uh, agency among female voters. Um, <clears throat> but she knows that her audience the the male Republican senators in front of her um, on the Senate floor aren't necessarily going to be swayed by, you know, oh, women have opinions? No, come on. Um, so, you know, she keeps that, she keeps that paragraph very, very short. That is a very short sentence um, in comparison to the rest. And it's the only reference to gender she makes throughout. It is an emotional appeal uh, but it's, it, it's very benign and it's very flattering to the men who might see themselves as, uh, stewards of the women in their family, you know, oh, well, you know, of course I'm in charge, but I care about my wife and my daughters. So, you know, I'm going to consider their position of things. Mm -hmm. Then she goes as a United States Senator. I am not proud of the way in which the Senate has been made a publicity platform for irresponsible sensationalism. And again, this is clearly, clearly McCarthy and his uh, over-the-top press conferences and show trials of, uh, of, uh, of people he is accused. Uh, he, he was he was a demagogue, and he worked uh, he worked the national press, you know, quite ingeniously. But he was a clown, and he made great copy. He made a lively picture, you know. To this day, you can watch old newsreels of his Senate hearings with Roy Cohn whispering in his ear every minute, and he's sitting there. Rah, 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 rah growling and hammering his gavel and shut up you know and and it's great theater um he was half in the bag most of the time he was a raging alcoholic uh he should have been he you know he had every right to hate himself because he was hateable but um uh, it makes great theater and so he was always able to play in that publicity realm and again the rather staid and stuffy uh, uh robert taft republicans of the time uh would probably you know, look 
down their noses at that sort of, oh, that common, you know, poo poo, that looks, you know, that just looks cheap. Because, uh, well, they weren't very good at that. But also, it, 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 they could recognize the true professional uh, um, uh, legislators can recognize what a clown show is, and they would not be approving of that. As an American, I am shocked at the way Republicans and Democrats alike are playing directly into the communist design of confuse, divide, and conquer. Uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats alike, uh, both sides is in there, but you get the sense that she's really only including Democrats because she doesn't want the, uh, the Republicans to go, well, yeah, but what about, you know, what about is, um, a, and pointing out that, okay, this is all just, this is part of what Russia wants us to do. This is part of what the Soviet Union, Russia wants us to do. It wants us to be fighting against itself, uh, against ourselves. It wants us to divide from one another. And it wants to, once it weakens us through division, it can then conquer us. That is the real progress. And she's pointing out that McCarthy is in fact playing into Russian hands as if he were a Russian puppet at the time. Again, eh, never happens again. Uh, as an American, I do not want Democratic administration whitewash or cover up any more than I want a Republican smear or witch hunt. And here, a um, couple of things. One, witch hunt is a very powerful term, and it's the one that everybody was using at the time, and it really gets to the heart of the McCarthy program. So you get the sense that the, uh, the Democratic administration whitewash of the problem, that's kind of weak. Uh, as a as a criticism, and she le she ends the sentence. She ends that uh, that little passage with witch hunt, which you get the sense that she's just kind of building to that. Because it's last in the uh, the paragraph, that's the idea she wants people to retain. So she builds to what her main point is, and that's what she wants people to take away from that moment. Then she goes, you know, as an American. I condemn a Republican fascist just as much as I condemn a Democrat. Here she's speaking uh, for the nation uh, as an American. She's really built it from the very local where she was writing, you know, as a Republican, as a woman, as a senator, which is all fairly contained. But now she's speaking for the entire nation as an American. Uh, as an American, I want to see our nation recapture the strength and unity it once had when we fought the enemy instead of ourselves. And that's conservatism. That is the belief that there are intrinsic values that need to be protected in this nation. Uh, you can argue it one way or the other, but that is the conservative position, that, uh, that it is to conserve what is good um, in the face of a changing world. But it's also that call that we we can't just devolve into uh, chaos in the Senate. That we need to have uh, rules that protect us and that call out uh, the uh, the malignant uh, the malignant actors within our walls. She points this out very logically, and she brings her audience around. Now, uh, historically, of course, uh, you can make the argument that, well, this didn't really do much. McCarthy was still roaring after this. Um, it took another seven years before, uh, before he was really uh, shut down, and, and he died soon after. Um, it would get to that point. McCarthy would continue on his rampage. His fellow uh, senators, Republicans, uh, his fellow Republicans eventually got quite sick of it. Uh, Eisenhower tolerated him for a little while after he got into office in 53, uh, but he was no fan of McCarthy's and started, you know, pushing him aside. And over time, uh, the erraticism, the alcoholism, the, uh, you know, the pure venom that he was spewing out uh, started to really catch up to him. 
and ultimately the Senate did censure him. So it cut him off from a lot of the support and oxygen that had been fueling his rise for so long. And he did die soon thereafter, uh, mercifully. But her call is still there. Maybe it didn't have the, you know, the dramatic effect right away, but she lodged that voice, that sentiment early. And it's, and it sits there on the record and in people's minds and people can go back and look at it and say, all right, yeah, she makes a good point here. Maybe she didn't actually get this great groundswell of support that she was hoping for. But I have to believe she had some effect, psychologically perhaps. Um, but the point is that in this speech, uh, she set out a vision. She set out a vision of what America should be, what uh, government should be. And she used basic rhetorical tools, basic rules of communication to make that point, to drive home what she had to say and to inspire others to agree with her. She makes an argument and you can say that, well, the argument ultimately wasn't successful or you can say that, well, she, it was successful just in the longer run. That's for historians. I don't really care. But the way the speech proceeds uses, while disdaining it at the beginning, saying, you know, I have no time for eloquence, she very carefully organizes what she says around a specific goal. Whether or not the goal is reached is an entirely different matter. But she organized her, she organized her words to a specific end. She spoke very very deliberately and you got to give it to her for that. <laughs>